Welcome back everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the first game of chess that Magnus Carlsen has played since he renounced his World Chess Championship title a few months ago and we had the match between Ding Loren and Jan Pomnesi which Ding won. So Magnus back in action, first game since he gave the title. Let's see how it goes. Now, before we jump into the game, of course, the tournament in question is the Superbet Rapid and Blitz tournament being played in Warsaw, Poland. So in the first game, we have Magnus Carlsen with the black piece against Radoslav Wojtaszek. Now, Radoslav opens with d4, and Magnus chooses to play b5 here. And this opening, of course, is the classic Polish opening. Tournament being held in Warsaw, Poland. Why not play this? So we get d4, b5. Game continues with e4. We get bishop to b7, and now we have bishop d3, and Magnus plays the move knight f6. Now, in the past, I've played many blitz games online. As I recall, I think after bishop takes b5, bishop takes e4, knight f3, e6, and c4, White is generally considered to be better theoretically, but you don't have to go into any of these variations in the first place. So, after bishop to d3 is played, Magnus plays knight f6. Now, White obviously has the big center here. Game continues with knight to d2, and now Magnus plays c5. Here we get c3 being played by Wojtaszek. Now, White could potentially take the pawn on c5, and you might think, well, White's up a pawn. What's the problem? Now, the issue with taking on the pawn but taking on c5, I should say, is that now black can play knight to a6, attacking the pawn on c5. If you move the knight trying to guard the pawn, then you hang the pawn on e4, and just like that, black is actually quite a bit better due to this weakness on c5. Additionally, if you don't protect the pawn on c5, say you play a move like knight to f3, knight takes c5 is played, and then you go queen e2 to protect the pawn. After black plays a move like e6, bishop e7, and castles, black has a lot of counterplay here. White can maybe end up winning a pawn on b5, but after knight to f4, these knights are very, very active here, right in the center of the board, and black is for choice. So after c5, Radoslav decides, you know what, I'm not having any of that. I'm just going to play classically and build this big center. Magnus trades on d4, and now he plays e6, and here we get the move knight gf3. Magnus goes knight to c6, and now Wojtaszek castles. Now again, Magnus here is really trying to induce Wojtaszek to try and go into some complications, potentially taking the pawn on b5 here. But after bishop b5 and queen b6 here, suddenly black is attacking both the bishop on b5 as well as the pawn on d4. So say you retreat with the bishop after knight takes d4 here, suddenly material is equal. And white is still probably a little bit for choice, but nonetheless, black has counterplay. And in a rapid game, especially where you can't think for 10, 15, 20 minutes in one go, you don't really want to get in these situations very early, especially because Magnus, Magnus's moves here are a pure reaction to what white plays. So Voitasha castles, Magnus plays a6 now, guarding the pawn on b5. Now we get rook to e1, and Magnus plays bishop to e7. Now once again, this whole flow of the game, it very much feels like Magnus is trying to bait Voitasha into going into complications. And now Voitasha finally decides to throw down the gauntlet and sacrifices a pawn in the center of the board by playing this move d5. Now... In this position back here, Magnus probably should have played d5 and after, after e5, knight d7, knight f1. White is a little bit better with ideas like knight g5, h4, knight g3, knight h5, but it's not that big of an advantage. Nonetheless, Magnus plays bishop e7, and as I said, Wojtaszek finally goes for it. He plays d5, we get e takes d5, and now the move e5 is played here. Magnus goes knight to h5. He could try a move like knight to e4, but after knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, suddenly white has this great bishop on e4. Additionally, his pawn on d7 is very weak as well, and white has a big advantage here. So we get knight to h5 played by Magnus. Wojtaszek plays knight b3, a very good move here. He wants to plop a pony on d4. Additionally, the bishop on c1 covers the f4 square, so you cannot jump with the knight. Magnus plays g6 here. Wojtaszek goes bishop h6, trying to stop Magnus from being able to castle. Additionally, if Magnus were to castle here, white can even play this move g4, which traps the knight on the rim. Knight can't go to either f4 or f6. So g6, bishop h6. Magnus plays rook g8 here, and now Wojtaszek plays bishop e3. A very nice move, maybe not the best move per se, but very pragmatic and practical, because now that Magnus has moved the rook, he can no longer castle the king. You can maybe try king f8 and force white to go back to h6, but nonetheless, white will make a decision based off of that, and with the inability to castle, it's already very tricky to play. So Magnus goes knight g7 with the idea of rerouting his knight to this e6 square and then maybe playing for d4 down the road and opening up scope for the bishop on b7. 
Game continues with knight c5, Magnus plays queen c7, Voitaja goes rook c1. Another very logical move because if you're thinking about this position from the white perspective, black's king in the center of the board is undeveloped, rook in the corner is undeveloped, and it seems very likely that black wants to castle the king by castling to the queen side here. So this seems very logical, but now if black castles after a4 here opening up the queen side, suddenly with this great knight on c5 and all this pressure on the c file, black is in a lot of trouble. So Magnus chooses to play knight to e6. Roddick takes the bishop on b7. Now, it's a very committal trade because when you look at the position, the bishop on b7 is very passive here with the knight and the pawn in the way of it. But nonetheless, you don't really want to trade the knights because then you correct black's pawn structure. Now all the pawns are very nicely placed. And if you go back to b3, you can obviously play this, but now black can go rook c8, maybe d4 down the road, and open up the scope for the bishop. So Vitajic trades. Now, Trading off the knight for the bad bishop, there's another very important point here, which is that once the knight is traded, now the ideas of black castling the king become very difficult because there are massive weaknesses on the king's on the queen side. One example is something like this with b4, white can go queen e2. And just like that, the pawn on a6 is very weak, whereas if you had a bishop here, it would be much easier to defend this pawn on the edge. So in this position after queen b7, we get bishop to f1 played by Wojtaszek trying to win the pawn on d5. Magnus goes bishop b4, we get rook to e2, and now knight to e7 is played trying to guard the pawn. Additionally, now white has this passive bishop on f1 with the rook in, in the way. And what Magnus is aiming for, if I just play some quiet random moves, is he'd love to trade off these dark square bishops. And then now with the passive bishop, these knights in the center of the board, black is probably only slightly worse at this point. So Magnus comes up with this very conceptual idea, guard the pawn, try to trade the dark square bishops, get rid of these weaknesses around the king, and if he can succeed, then he's going to be in it to win it. So the game continues with rook e to c2, and now we get the move knight to f5 being played by Magnus. Maybe not the best move, maybe he still should try to play bishop a5, b6, but even here, it's very difficult to play because if white plays a quiet move like g3, bishop b6, and trades, while black is okay, you still have the problem of dealing with the double stack on the c file, the pawn in the center is very weak, and you can't really get the king out of the center easily. Maybe you can go king f8 and king g7, but it still feels very difficult to play, and most importantly, in a rapid game, you want to have quick, easy moves, and you don't have quick, easy moves, whereas white has very obvious ideas. Go after the pawns on the D file, use the open C file, maybe try to checkmate the king on the dark squares on the king side, and that is the extent of the situation. So, in this position, we get knight to f5 being played by Magnus instead, and here Roddick goes bishop g5. Very happy to trade off the knight for the bishop here, because now without the knight on e6, black has a lot of problems. If you play h6, there's even knight h7 to go knight f6. You even have rook c7 here as well, and there are all kinds of issues that black has to deal with. So after bishop g5, we get bishop to e7 played by Magnus. Again, trying to follow up the theme of exchanging the dark square bishops. Roddick plays bishop f6 here, and the point is very simple. Now he's happy to trade the bishops, because now this pawn on f6 restricts black's king. A lot of weaknesses. Maybe you can even get a queen to e7 and get some kind of lolly checkmate down the road. And it's just very hard to play, because you can also kick the knight from f5 with g4 next move. So Magnus plays knight fg7. We get queen to d3 played here by Roddick. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and now Magnus goes knight h5. And what Magnus is banking on in this position is that he can win this pawn on f6. And if he wins this pawn on f6, he's probably okay in a position like this simply because the knight covers the c7 square. He's guarding the c8 square and slowly can probably move the king out and then bring the other rook. One example just to illustrate it is that if he can get to a position like this, suddenly he's up two pawns, his knights are good, his king is very safe in the fianchetto here, and he has the rooks on the queen side to trade, and black is just better. So it's very committal here by Magnus going into this, and Magnus is assuming at this point in the game that he is going to win this pawn on f6. So the game continues with queen to c3. We get rook to d8 played here by Magnus, and now we have a3. Now this move is not the best move. Computer likes queen e5 more, but again in a rapid game where you don't have all day to think, you kind of need to make practical decisions, and a3 is just a practical move. It stops b4. You still guard the pawn on f6. You don't have to go to like e5, because if you were to go here, there is even just d6 attacking the queen. And then what? Do you just go back to c3? Do you go to e3? Regardless, the idea is not clear, and so you don't want to have such complications in a rapid game specifically. So we get a3. Magnus plays queen to b8 here, and now we get g3. The idea behind queen b8, very obvious, to go queen f4 and gobble the pawn on f6. So g3 stops queen f4. Also, now you can fianchito the bishop to g2 or h3. 
So here the game continues with g5 being played by Magnus, and now Roddick plays this move rook to e1. Now rook to e1 is a very, very nice move here, but again, every every situation here is move by move. What Magnus is assuming is that he's going to be able to win this pawn on f6, and if he wins it, he'll be fine, whereas Roddick, even though he has the classic triple stack on the c-file, can't really infiltrate here, and how do you proceed? So in this position, we get rook to e1 being played, and now we have the move g4 played by Magnus. Perhaps he could have tried rook g6. Now, this, this move actually is not great, but it would have been really interesting to see what Wojtaszek would have come up with here, because the best line the computer likes is bishop to d3, and if rook takes f6, now you play this very nice move, knight takes g5. However, in a rapid game where you don't have so much time to think, I know I'm being a little bit repetitive here, it would have been interesting because the players are getting a little bit low on time, not super low, but still, to maintain this accuracy to be precise with limited time it would have been interesting to see nonetheless magnus instead plays g4 we get knight to d4 and now rook to g5 is played and this more or less i think starts is the start of the beginning of the end for magnus in this position rook g6 would have been a better move and the reason is very simple after bishop d3 and rook takes f6 you'll notice that there's no knight on f3 to capture the pawn on g5 so to compare we have this position right here where white could gobble. But in this position, after it takes f6, the knight is on d4, the pawn is on g4. So now black is up two pawns. And while white is still much better after this move, bishop f5, going after the pawn on g4, in this position, it's not obvious to a human why this should be winning. And I would have really, I really wonder whether Magus would have actually lost this game if he had played this rook g6, rook f6 capture. Because to me, this doesn't seem obvious. And even here, after move like king to e7, playing the classic bomb cloud variation bishop takes g4 knight g7 the king is very safe on e7 no access to f5 square if you play queen before i can even go queen d6 here and at this point how do you go after the king yes you can play f4 and try to go f5 but even f4 king f8 knight takes e6 rook takes e6 still very very tricky to play because after takes takes suddenly the pawns are connected king runs a g8 you have knight f5 rook f8 and while i think that white is much better it's still very much a game here and against a great defender like magnus you never know what would have happened Instead, Magnus goes rook g5 with a different concept here, which is he wants to play rook to e5 and potentially trade the rooks or slide the king to f8 and g8 and just get it out of the center of the board. Roddick, however, plays this move bishop d3. Excellent decision here. Magnus goes rook to e5, trying to trade the rooks. King f8 is maybe a move as well, but after takes, takes, and bishop takes h7, white still remains quite a bit better. Again, would this have happened? Very hard to judge because honestly, trading the knights here and correcting the black pawn structure does not feel like the right idea. So it would have been very interesting to see, but instead Magnus, when he played rook g5, he, had, he was dead set on a specific concept and he does play rook to e5. We get knight to f5 played here by, by Roddick. We get rook takes rook, queen takes rook, and now it's really starting to fall apart here for Magnus because his king is in the middle of the board. White has this great pony on f5. As the old saying goes, a knight on f5 is worth at least a pawn according to the former world chess champion, Gary Kimovich Kasparov. So, after queen takes e1 you've got the great knight the pawns are bad black can't trade the rooks because then you get forked here by knight to d6 winning the queen and if you can't do that it's very very hard to play so magnus goes knight takes f6 here trying to say well i'm up two pawns all i need is one or two more moves get the king out of the middle of the board and i will win the game game continues with queen to b4 a very strong move threatening a checkmate on e7 here with the queen and the knight magnus plays d6 only move stopping the mate and now we get queen to c3 and here, Magnus finally blunders with this move knight to d7. Now, what's remarkable about, remarkable about this game and just looking at it with the evaluation even is the computer says that after this move knight to g8, which of course is completely inhuman and impossible to play in a quick game of chess, that after queen h8 and this wild move king d7, queen takes h7 and rook f8, somehow black is magically still very much in the game king is very safe with the pawns in front of it. The knight covers some critical squares here, and you can even bring your other knight into the game. Now, after queen h4, queen d8, queen takes g4, and knight e7, white still remains quite a bit better after h4, but the show goes on here. And I think this just speaks to the resources in the game of chess that we've learned from using computers for so long, that even in this position, which looks completely hopeless here, there still are chances. If you play some good moves, you keep defending, there are always going to be opportunities and chances if your opponent is not 3,500. So, 
After queen c3, Magnus plays knight to d7. We get this move queen to h8, check being played by Wojtaszek. Knight d to f8, trying to hold the glue here. Knight guards a pawn, knights guard each other. If black could just get this king to d7 here, for example, and then, then rook c8, suddenly black is maybe back in the game. However, after knight to f8, Rada correctly finds move queen to f6, threatening checkmate again on e7 with the queen and the knight. And now Magnus is pretty much lost here because it's very hard to stop this mate threat. If you play a move like queen to a7, for example, I can even play a move like rook to e2. Idea to go knight g7 next move. And if you play like rook d7, this is actually checkmate on the spot. If you move, say, the queen after check, king d7, queen takes f7. The house collapses immediately, and just like that, you're down a bishop. White will get the double-A battery on the diagonal, and you will lose the game. So Magnus tries to defend with knight g6, stopping the mate on e7, stopping the check on h8 as well. But Roddick makes no mistakes here, and he finds rook to e2. And now Magnus is simply crushed here because there are no good moves. You go king to f8, I just take the knight. You can't capture the rook due to the pin. And queen g7 will be checkmate next move. Additionally, you move the king, I just take, and then I take the knight next turn. And if you don't, well, I also have this check. So Magnus plays queen c7, and Roddick plays knight to g7 check here. And now Magnus Carlsen, the former world chess champion, has to resign in his first game back playing competitive chess since he gave up the title. Magnus resigns here simply because king f8, knight takes e6, loses the house. It's the classic family fork. Go king d7, just takes, and then take the knight, and it's, it's all just completely hopeless here with bishop e4, even knight to f5, and that's all she wrote. So Magnus ends up resigning the game. First game back that he's played of chess since he gave up the title. A big surprise here. Obviously, Magnus trying to meme a little bit. He's in Poland. Why not play the Polish opening? As the old saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So he tries to pull out the old saying from the old, old good book about, you know, when in Poland, do what the Poles do. But the Polish opening, not quite good enough at this level. So Magnus loses in his first game of the Super Bet event being held in Warsaw, Poland. There are still two more games, but I actually am only recapping in this one game because very soon I have to catch a flight to Norway in, in advance of Chess Champions Tour and of course Norway Chess starting at the end of the month where I will be playing against none other than Magnus Carlsen. So at any rate I hope you guys have enjoyed this video make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already and I'll be back very soon with some more great recaps and all kinds of great chess content here on YouTube. See you guys soon. Bye.